First thing. Okay, let's get started. Um, True North and technical debt. Uh, this, is a, this is a talk for me about continuous improvement. Uh, it's a talk about a bunch of ideas I've stolen from way smarter people than myself. And yeah, and this is also, uh, this is also like our story, I find my past of trying to become a continuous improvement kind of engineering team. So. Kind of started with a question: Is why don't we get faster? Uh, and this is a it's, a it's a tough one because I don't really know. Um, the you know, like if if you are training for like a marathon and you're running a lot, you get faster, right? If you are, you know, like I do a lot of bike riding, and the more you train, the faster you get. But this wasn't happening for dev teams. I've you know, there's, it's been rare that I've been on a dev team where, you know, like a year into it, you're actually going faster than you were at the start. And I was wondering why that was. So I was starting to think of reasons. We don't fix problems. Um, what do I mean by that? So I've been on loads of dev teams where you start and then you start delivering a little less and then, you know, you stop and you're like, right, we're going to improve. And then you start delivering a little less and it just kind of, you end up in this cycle of, delivering less and less and less as complexity goes up. We end up feeling a bit powerless that we can't get out of this. Um, and you know, they're like, oh, it's just too much. So you just kind of get on with it and you just toil away. Uh, we, we're subject to what I call, well, it's not what I call, it is bounded rationality. This is why fishermen overfish is because they can only see the benefit to themselves of doing something. They don't see the wider picture. They don't think long term. Uh, and that's why we need other mechanisms to control that kind of stuff. And we're addicted to complexity. As engineers, we love a bit of complexity. Uh, I've read this brilliant book called The Impl Simplicity Cycle. And uh, yeah, you've got goodness along one side and complexity along another. So you, know, you start building something, you add some complexity, the goodness goes up. But quite soon, it starts doing that. The product starts getting worse as it gets more complex. Everything slows down and that kind of stuff. But actually, what you need to do is that, is reduce the complexity, but keep the goodness. Uh, yeah, so read that book, Dan Ward, The, complex, uh, the Simplicity Cycle. It's brilliant. Anyway, we have become normalized to deviance. Um, what do I mean by that? You just kind of get used to things being broken. You don't fix that alert that wakes you up at two in the morning. Uh, I had a really good, ex I have a really good example of this. It's something I've done in the last week. So I organize the meetings for my team and uh, I do the agendas. And I've been doing that for 18 months. And it took me two days to completely automate the process in Google Scripts. And now I don't have to do that anymore. And th this is an example of me becoming normalized to just a bunch of toil that I had to do every, every week, chasing people for actions, all that kind of stuff. It can be automated. And yeah, this is, this is what that looks like, I think, over time. So this is where we were uh, as a company, find my past. Uh, and th this is a while ago, so we, we kind of started on this journey about three years ago um, and came up with this uh, concept, a true north. So what is a true north? Um, we have got the, the DevOps pillars here. So we have CAMS, the C-A-M and S. That was by John Willis and Damon Edwards back in 2010. Uh, but then... Jez Humble added Lean, uh, which I really like because we've got loads to learn from companies from like Toyota. Uh, so yeah, True North is, uh, is shamelessly stolen from Lean and from Toyota. And it's, uh, it's talked about in, in these two books a little bit. Uh, if you want to learn about continuous improvement, I can't recommend these two books more highly. Uh, they're absolutely fabulous. And, and this is where a lot of the, the ideas from this came from. So yeah, 
back to that question, what is a true north? <laughs> true north is a, it's a long range target of how we're gonna do something. So, you know, like as a business, you have your why, you have your purpose. Um, then you have the how you're going to achieve that purpose and then what you're going to build. Um, that's Simon Sinek's golden circle thing. But what, what this is, is it's a long range target of how. It's a vision of how. And this is Toyota's vision of how. So they have four things. Zero defects, 100% value added, one piece flow and security for people. That is nothing to do with building cars. It's nothing to do why they're a business or what they're building. It's how they're going to go about doing it. Uh, and, that's, and that's what it's about. So this is, a, this is a really interesting concept for continuous improvement because what it does is it gets rid of a lot of arguments. Have you ever had an argument where you said, um, I'm going to automate uh, th this, this bit of something that, that takes me five minutes every day, and then someone questions the value of that? Yeah. I'm, I've, I've definitely had that argument more than once. And that's what this is, this is to, you know, if, if you have something here, a principle that you can't argue with, it just stops that. No, actually, we have, we, we work towards zero defects. Defects are not okay in any circumstance, so we're gonna improve towards removing all defects. And you, you just don't have those kind of arguments anymore. So that's the point of it, is it's to align a business around how you're gonna go about something. So our true north is our long range, unachievable target of how we build brilliant software. That's what we started off with as a concept. And we, <coughs> we got together at a tech product summit about 18 months ago, and we, basically as a, as a group of about, I think it was about 55 of us from the engineering and product team, we were lucky enough to, to get together for a couple of days to actually, you know, set out these principles and start working together. So this was something we got to do. So we started off, this is how we started picking our True North, was nine options with nine pitches. So we put up some options that people could uh, get behind. So automate everything, uh, a frictionless experience for all, and continuous and instant deployment. We've got 100% uptime, zero defects, monitor alert and visualize everything. And then always improving, always experimenting, 100% business value and something else. So these are all impossible. You can't ever achieve these goals. That's the point, is they set a really long range vision of how you're gonna do something. You're never gonna be able to achieve it, but the point is that you always work towards it, right? So. Out of all of our product and engineering team, everyone kind of self-selected into the thing that they cared most about. Uh, and what they had to do was then pitch that to all the rest of us, and then we just did dot voting. So a lot like open spaces. Uh, and this is what we ended up with. So we kind of had this 100% uh, business value, and we put that kind of in the middle. And then the, the three that we felt really fed into that was monitor, alert, and visualize everything a frictionless experience for all, and always improving, always experimenting. So now that argument about that five, minute, uh, five minutes of toil that you want to spend a day automating, that's friction. It's no longer an argument. It's, it no longer beco uh, becomes, should we do it? It's, when do we do it? Okay, so, then we made our big mistake. <laughs> we didn't rule out the change properly. Uh, we didn't support it it just kind of f fittered away afterwards. We didn't think, how are we gonna, we, we, we built up this huge amount of enthusiasm over a couple of days, and, and we thought, how, how, are we gonna, how are we gonna take this forward? And, and we just didn't really do anything. The, the, the BAU just got the better of us. The, we, we just kept, kind of doing what we were doing, we, we talked a little bit about it. It started entering the, the lingo a little bit, you know, like we talked about doing True North stuff, um, but we never really figured out how are we gonna embed this in our culture and our processes? How are we gonna really roll this out properly? Yeah. So um, we got to a point where we thought, 
okay, we want to actually give this a proper go. This was about six months later at this point, uh, kind of maybe about this time last year. And we figured we needed to embed this and, and get some real time to go after it. So yeah, we needed time. So this is a point where I had to then kind of go with my hat in hand and uh, say, yeah, we want some time from, from the business. So I had to kind of put together some stuff that, that's just coming through in the, next, uh, in the next set of slides. And this is how I sold it to the business. So this is what I started with. <laughs> <laughs> this, is, uh, this is how I view execs. <laughs> And uh, yeah, they, they like that. They laugh too, so that's good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so it's it's quite a thing to go to go to uh, you know a bunch of folk running a company and say actually we want to take a day a week away from delivering product and put it towards uh, you know doing other stuff, and they're like okay, so yeah, not sure I like that idea because I've got all these initiatives that I want to achieve. I've got all this product I want to ship, so that we started there. So I started introducing them to some, some kind of mental models where they could understand uh, what, what we do in engineering um, at a kind of a high level. So the first thing is that standards aren't real. Th this has been raised to me a couple of times by product. Can't they they kind of do this thing where they go, can't you just introduce a standard? And you're like, well, you can introduce the standard, but that doesn't mean that anyone actually has to do it. Um, and and this is part of lean is that the you know the, you're either getting better or you're getting worse. The, there's no balanced state. If if you if you are kind of in a balanced state, it's probably more of like a sine wave going up and up and down. You know, like you get a little better, you get a little worse. You get a little better, you get a little worse. And that's the that that's the thing with standards. Standards set a bar, but there's there's nothing keeping you at that bar. You you know you're either improving or degrading as a as a team as a you know as an organization, and that's what kind of continuous improvement is all about. Um, Toyota. I mean, I, d I don't know if you you guys know this, but so every car that Toyota sells in the U.S. they make three thousand dollars profit. Their next competitor makes a thousand dollars profit. And how do they do that? It's the culture of improvement that they have lets them have, you know, the time, quality, and cost. And it, it's pretty amazing. So if, if you can get there with standards that processes are either improving or atrophying, then, you know, that, that's the first concept to understand. The second thing about engineering is imagine this, this is one day of time, okay? And we, and what I tried to break down was that we do really four things. So yeah, four types of work. First thing is firefighting. You know, we've all had a severity one incident, I hope. Uh, and yeah, that's firefighting. You know, you're, you're mitigating a problem. Then you've got improvement. You're working on, on like automation for, to give yourself more time next week. Then you've got toil. Toil's like the tax you pay in order to innovate. So, I, I don't know, it's like, you see, if you, if you come and you do a bit of work and it takes you two days to, to kind of get this thing in um, and then actually just half an hour to make the, the, the change that you needed to make, you've kind of got two days of toil and half an hour of innovation, which is the last time. So, any, t any time that you spend on toil and firefighting is waste. This is... Uh, this is kind of stolen from the Phoenix Project as well. They, they talk about the four types of work. We tried using their lingo, but it didn't work for us. Uh, so this is the lingo that we came up with um, because this is kind of how we view the types of work that we do. So how much of each type do you think we spend? So I, I posed that to, the, to the, the exec team, and, and this is kind of what they thought. Th this is what they would love to be true. <laughs> <laughs> it's also a lie. <laughs> I didn't think this slide would get a laugh, but that's awesome. <laughs> uh, yeah, so here's the reality. Maybe 10% firefighting, maybe more. 
maybe a little bit of improvement if you're lucky, a lot of toil, and a little bit of innovation. But how could we prove that? So, but that, that was to, I, I used this in the, 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 there's the really good case study of HP and their, their laser jet firmware division. Um, I, th I think the book's called Leading the, Leading the Transformation, but it's, it's a terrific kind of short summary of how they did this. And this is kind of, if, if, you, if you measure your types of work like this, it's kind of like activity-based costing. Um, kind of, it's not, it's not completely like that, but it's kind of like that. Anyway, the idea is that you use your 20% your improvement time in order to tackle toil and firefighting. The more you get rid of those, the more time you have to innovate. It's, you know, it's a simple mental model. And then finally, this is kind of how we describe it. So constant and deliberate improvement to reduce toil and firefighting to make room for more innovation. Because that's what you want at the end of the day. The innovation is what drives the business forward, is what customers want to see. It, you know, that, there's the value. And then finally, we've got intuition. So this is about short term versus long term, about us as human beings being able to, um, how intuitive we are about things. So I'm going to try a little uh, thought experiment with you guys, and hopefully it will work. Right. Everyone here who has a mortgage, put your hands up. Great. OK. If you can figure out, keep your hands up. If you can in, uh, figure out how much you're going to pay roughly for your mortgage in the next six months, keep your hand up in your head. OK. If you can imagine overpaying 500 pounds a month, how much does that shorten your mortgage by? Keep your hand up. That's the point. You can't, you can't be intuitive about long-term things that in, involve exponentials. It's, it, it's a human thing, and that's why I'm led to believe that we always do, you know, it's much easier for us to go, here's a short-term thing, I get it, you know, you can, it's very intuitive versus a long-term thing, which is totally unintuitive, so you just discard it. Uh, gonna quote another guy, Dan Daniel Kahneman, thinking fast and slow. That, this is one of these things. So yeah, I'm gonna do a little thing. So imagine no improvement. Um, in week one, we deliver 10 value as a, you know, as a concept. In week two, we deliver 10 value. In week three, we deliver 10 value. Now, that's not true. You'll deliver slightly less each week as you add more complexity. But anyway, so at the end of three weeks, you deliver 30 value. A 1% improvement each week. So I'm going to trade two value at one day a week. And what I'm going to get is a 1% improvement in the value that I can then deliver each week. Everyone with me so far? OK, so this is my value per week, 8, 8.08, 8.16. So at the end of the three weeks, we've delivered about six less value <laughs> with continuous improvement. And that, that seems sucky because that's the, that's the short-term thinking. Okay, but let's, let's extrapolate it out to years. So at 10 value, at year one, we're 520, 1040, 1560, 2080. It's really intuitive. You can figure that out, no problem. 8% value at 1%. Is it more or less? Yay! <laughs> yeah. So not that much at the end of one year. Uh, but then that's only 1%. You might get more. Uh, then at two years of improvement, you're, a, you know, you're, you're 500 plus. You're almost double at year three. And yeah, you've got more than double uh, in, in year four. So yeah, that's the gains. And that's... That's something that we don't really get, is that, you know, with improvement, if we deliberately improve, the, I mean, <laughs> there's, there's a great example of this. It's like, why can a team of, say, 16, like Basecamp, continue to make all of the products that they make? They have 16 engineers, and they have this, this amazing, huge product. Yet, we're a team of 45, and we're kind of struggling. Uh, and then, you know, like, our main competitors are 160 and 400 developers. How, what do we need to do in order to be able to compete with them and outperform them? I think it's this. So yeah, they, 
we, I pitched this as a pilot. So we take a single team and we were going to run this for a quarter and see what the results were. So that was what we did. And uh, what we started doing was measuring where we spent our time. So uh, there's a great guy, Chris, at our work. He, he kind of set this up. And um, we, we, we created just a little sheet of paper. And at stand up each morning, you said, how did I spend my time yesterday? And you got a check for the morning and a check for the afternoon. So you ended up with a sheet like this. Every morning at stand up, you put your, your checks on the sheet. And then at the end of the week, uh, we kind of totaled it up. And we ended up with graphs like this. Um, so this was just for a single team that they were looking at. And it's, it's really interesting because the, to begin with, they didn't actually spend the time on improvement until they got a nudge. And, or at least they didn't think they were improving. So, but what they did was they, they tackled two really hard problems. There was a legacy code base that they were working with that they, they automated the entire pipeline for it. So it got to the point of uh, continuous delivery where they just needed to click the button. And that didn't take them as long as they thought. And they, th this was during the first phase. Uh, sorry, you can't see that. This was during the first phase here. They didn't actually think they were using their improvement time, but they were just kind of chipping away at it. And then that, that helped them you know, start really being able to spend a lot more time tackling the business problems and doing the innovation rather than you know, fighting with the build system. And then after that, they, they did a whole bunch of synthetic testing around our analytics because they, they were looking at the results, not getting the results that they thought. And, uh, and, and were really confused by it. So ended up proving that our analytics pipeline was broken by doing a bunch of synthetic testing, which was really, really cool because that had been broken for a while. Uh, so any results of experiments weren't actually you know, valid, which is kind of sucks. <laughs> so yeah, success. Uh, you know, we proved value in the system. The the team, you know, like measured what they were doing. They kind of in the in the retros and kind of once a week they were they were they were looking at how they were spending their time. They were, you know, and then going right. We're going to tackle this problem and we're going to use these principles to guide us. So that that was the point of the true north. So yeah, finally rolling it out. This was kind of the easy part, I guess. So it was just taking all of the dev teams through the, the concept again. So it's the four types of work, uh, what our, our true north was, because a year on, we had to remind them. Well, obviously, they'd forgotten. <laughs> uh, and yeah, to start measuring. So I think this has now become much more automated and it's just kind of spreadsheets. Uh, and the, the teams are kind of measuring how they're spending their time. Now, not all teams have adopted this. We didn't force it. We just thought we would try and do it. And if, the, if it worked for the teams, then great. And if it didn't work, not so great. So what worked and what didn't? Uh, a True North day did work for us. So some teams decided to just do this on Monday or on Friday. Uh, and that worked for them because it was kind of like it, it was a good separation, and the, they didn't have to make any priority calls. They just said, okay, Monday we're doing this stuff. Tuesday through Friday we are, are working on our, on our feature work. And, th and they did this because they were planning it in at 20% of their work um, in terms of the, the points that they were taking on for a sprint. And it always, always got pushed to the bottom, and they never got to it. So that was why we switched to kind of a bimodal way of working and just went, right, Mondays is that, everything else is that. So that is kind of where we are right now. And then finally, I thought I would talk about what's next. So the, the second Toyota Kata book is, is really interesting, the, the way that they talk about how they, the, the management structure there and how you have these conversations. So it's, it's how you scale that, that improvement and that mindset. And it's, I think, what might work and of what I'd like to try is, is identifying one person on each team and creating a cycle with the uh, problem owners. So, you know, like the, there's this, this great phrase, if you, don't, if you don't think you've got problems, you've got really big problems. Um, so it's having one person on each team to be the kind of the champion on that team, thinking about 
uh, what problems that they have. Uh, and then also bringing that together in some kind of cycle, uh, maybe a weekly or a fortnightly cycle. So you reflect and analyze that. The, the team does it themselves with uh, their team, with their problem owner. And then, uh, the, and then that becomes, you take that a step further and then you get all the problem owners together and then they start talking together. So you start thinking about the more macro level improvements that you could do. Because you don't want to do this in a vacuum. You don't want each team to, you know, like they, they don't operate independently. They work on shared code bases and that kind of stuff. So you want to be able to plan common improvements across the whole thing. And that comes down to the bounded rationality thing. You, you want to try and implement mechanisms to get people to understand the whole uh, and not just their little bit of the whole. Uh, and yeah, that's really me. And it's gone a lot faster than I thought. <laughs> but yeah, let's go faster.